Peru's rich history can be best characterized as a long struggle for democracy, where authoritarian regimes of one stripe or another have dominated the political landscape. This pattern seems to have changed in the 21st century, but Peruvians are still far from solving their problems. To see why, join me for this brief look at the history and politics of Peru. Our story begins 15,000 years ago, the earliest date we have of human remains in the country. These were found at Huaca Prieta, some 600 kilometers north of Lima, underneath an earth mound that itself was built a bit later, 7,800 years ago. In the following millennia, there would be dozens of cultures that would develop throughout the future country's territory, some more complex than others. These include the first city in the Americas, Caral, built some 5,000 years ago, about 180 kilometers north of Lima in the Supe Valley, the Chavin culture, which developed in the northern highlands of Peru and is most famous for its religion center, Chavin de Huantar, built sometime around 1200 BCE, the Moche culture, based in the northern Peruvian coast and best known for its Huaca del Sol, the largest pre-Columbian structure in the country, the Tiwanaku, a civilization that spanned the modern borders of Bolivia, Chile, and Peru, and whose ceramic pieces in the form of people and animals have gained special renown, and of course the most well-known of all, the Inca culture, which dominated the region and built the largest empire in pre-Columbian America for roughly a century starting in 1438. Known for their monumental architecture, extensive road network, fine woven textiles, and clever use of knotted strings or quipus to record information, Inca society revolved around the Sapa Inca, a king who was said to be a direct heir to Inti, son in Quechua, their language. Ruled from the capital in Cusco, the Tihuantinsuyo, as the Incas called their empire, began to fall apart in the early 16th century when the Sapa Inca, Huayna Capac, died without leaving a clear heir, prompting a civil war between two claimants to the throne, Huascar and Atahualpa. The latter emerged victorious in 1532 after a conflict that saw the death of some 100,000 people and promptly had Huascar in prison. Atahualpa seemed to have a bright future ahead, but unbeknownst to him, a tragic fate awaited him. That's because the reason why Nakapak had died in the first place was because of a much larger threat that loomed just over the horizon, the Spanish. Led by Francisco Pizarro, they had first explored the South American coast between 1524 and 1526, bringing with them smallpox, a disease that spread like wildfire and eventually would kill the Inca emperor. Then, in 1531, Pizarro landed in the northern coast of Peru and taking advantage of the weakened Inca forces as a result of their civil war, began slowly conquering the country. By 1536, the Spanish had managed to conquer the Inca capital of Cusco after already having captured Atahualpa and have him executed in August 1533. This would not be quite the end of the empire, however. The Inca resistance would continue from its stronghold in Vilcabamba until 1572, when the last Sapa Inca, Tupac Amaru, was captured and executed. The Spanish would then incorporate the region into its vast empire in the Americas with the creation of the Viceroyalty of Peru, a colonial enterprise with base in Lima that had two main purposes. First, extraction of resources, especially gold, that could then be sent to the crown, and second, the conversion of the natives into Christianity. This operation lasted roughly three centuries. Not that everyone was happy with the arrangement. In 1780, a self-proclaimed Sapa Inca, Tupac Amaru II, mobilized a massive rebellion, one of the most serious challenges to Spanish power in the Americas prior to independence. But he was also captured and executed. Peruvian independence would have to wait until 1821, when troops led by José de San Martín invaded, an Argentine army that had itself come to be as a result of the turmoil that was unleashed by Napoleon's toppling of the Spanish king in 1808, and which had prompted a civil war in Spanish America between those who wanted to stay loyal to the king and those who wanted independence. Peru was one of the last royalist strongholds, hence the invasion. Because Peru had been the core part of a larger viceroyalty during the colonial period, its first independent years were full of conflict, trying to define the country's national territory. This was particularly true with regards to Bolivia, with whom it had a short-lived confederation between 1836 and 1839. Once the boundary issue was settled, there remained the key problem of establishing reasonable procedures for attaining and succeeding to political office. Peru had at least 15 constitutions in its first 40 years as an independent country, but force remained the normal route to political power. Of the 35 presidents during this period, only four were elected according to constitutional procedures, and no civilians held power for more than a few months. The country would find some measure of stability under the governance of Ramón Castilla, a mestizo, who would be elected to his first term in 1845. The income from the guano boom, which he had been key in exploiting, helped Castilla make needed economic improvements, 
he abolished slavery, paid off some of Peru's debt, and established a public school system. After Castilla, the country once again descended into chaos, not to mention economic upheaval. By 1874, Peru was bankrupt. This left the country in a weak position to deal with the expanding clash between Chile and Bolivia over nitrate-rich lands in the Atacama Desert. Peru opted to enter into a defensive alliance with Bolivia, which eventually led to what the Peruvians know as the War of the Pacific. The fighting was absolutely disastrous for Peru. The Chileans occupied Lima and took the southernmost region of Tarapacá and would regain the region of Tacna until 1929. It did, however, help put civilians in charge of the government, starting in 1895. Unlike much of Latin America during the 19th century, Peru was divided politically less by a conservative liberal cleavage and more by the issue of military or civilian rule. This war helped settle that debate for the time being, although the civilian rulers in question were still a small group of elites and did not represent most Peruvians. The civilian-led period lasted between 1895 and 1919, what the Peruvians call the aristocratic republic. This era brought some modernization that embraced neo-positivist ideas. Instead of expanding to include more Peruvians, however, the military ended it. Many factors explain its demise. First, the civilista party suffered periodic severe internal divisions. Other parties were personalistic, rising and falling with the fortunes of their individual leaders. Second, there was severe domestic inflation, precipitated by the international economic crisis accompanying World War I. Third, elite-oriented parties were increasingly unwilling to respond to a wide array of demands from new groups entering the political system as the result of expanded government services, especially education. After the start of the Great Depression in 1929, the country's history becomes a blur of dictatorships punctuated by periods of democracy. Between 1914 and 1984, the only elected civilian to complete a term was Manuel Prado. He was actually elected twice, between 1939 and 1945, and 1956 and 1962, but was only permitted to finish his first. His success was not a coincidence. Prado was void by a solid economy and a willingness to accommodate the military. Meanwhile, perhaps the two most notable dictators were former army colonel Manuel Odria, who ruled from 1948 to 1956 and spent most of his time cracking down on the opposition and encouraging U.S. foreign investment. There was also Juan Velasco Alvarado, the former commander-in-chief of the army, who took control in 1968. Though he was expected to lead a conservative regime, Velasco turned out to be a populist. He established a nationalist agenda that included Peruvianizing, that is, securing Peruvian majority ownership of various industries. In his rhetoric, he celebrated the indigenous peasantry, championed a radical program of agrarian reform, and made Quechua an official language. He also severely restricted press freedom, which drew the wrath of the power structure in Lima. Ultimately, his economic policies were failures, and in 1975, in declining health, he was replaced by another, more conservative military regime. As authoritarianism prevailed, Peru would witness a sea change in intellectual thought, in particular the rise of indigenismo, a movement that advocated for a dominant social and political role for indigenous people. One of those inspired by the new ideas was Victor Raúl Aya de la Torre, a Trujillo-born political leader who would go on to found the Alianza Popular Revolucionaria Americana, that is, American Popular Revolutionary Alliance, otherwise known as APRA. The party espoused populist values, celebrated Indo-America, and rallied against U.S. imperialism. It would soon become a genuinely mass-based political party that would become the most important political organization of the first half of the 20th century. By most accounts, APRA was strong enough to determine the outcome of all open elections held in Peru after 1931. For more than 50 years, however, the military ensured that the party would never rule directly. Although APRA had a strong popular appeal, the party's importance for Peruvian politics rests on its reformist ideology and its organizational capacity. By absorbing much of the newly emerging social forces in the country, such as labor and students, it prevented a more radical option from developing. Eventually, APRA moved to the right, willing to compromise to gain power between 1956 and 1982. It became a center conservative party. Such actions discredited the party for many, but it still remained Peru's best organized and most unified political force. The other important party of the period was Acción Popular, or AP, a liberal and reformist party with somewhat similar message to APRA, although its tactics were more inclusive and less confrontational. It was founded in 1956 by Fernando Belaunde, member of an elite family and trained architect who became famous when in 1956 he led a massive protest demanding the government accept his candidacy filing. The government responded by turning massive water cannons into the crowd. When the confrontation looked to turn violent, 
Belaunde showed the gift for symbolism that would serve him well throughout his political life. Calming down the demonstrators and armed solely with the Peruvian flag, he crossed alone the gap separating the demonstrators from law enforcement to deliver an ultimatum to the police chief that his candidacy be accepted. The government then relented. As it happens, unlike APRA, the AP was allowed to take office in 1965, but as the country faced growing economic difficulties between 1967 and 1968, the military stepped in yet again. On October 3, 1968, with a bloodless coup, the armed forces began a long-term, institutionalized military rule under Juan Velasco Alvarado. When democracy returned, it would be Belaunde who once again returned to the presidency. The military's regime ended for multiple reasons, but the most important was its economic handling. The government had tried to maintain an import substitution model that would create national industry, but unable to maintain it with local resources, the military government turned to foreign loans, often short-term ones, to keep up the momentum, which produced a severe debt crisis by 1978. Unable to keep the country afloat, the military allowed a democratic transition, which also included a new constitution in 1979. The economic problems continued in Belaunde's second term as inflation began to accelerate. Foreign debt worsened, going from $8.4 billion in 1980 to $13 billion in 1985, and devastating weather from the El Niño Ocean Current caused severe damage to the country's agriculture. Even worse was the surfacing of the Shining Path, a guerrilla movement that would be a serious problem for the country for decades. Originally based in the isolated south-central Sierra Department of Ayacucho and headed by former professors and students from the local university of Huamanga, Shining Path advocated a peasant-based republic forged to revolution. The group's ideology was Marxist-Leninist, based on the principles of Mao and José Carlos Mariátegui, a leading Peruvian intellectual of the 1920s who founded what became the Communist Party of Peru. By the time they were mostly neutralized in the 2000s, they had killed some 30,000 Peruvians. At the same time, another leftist guerrilla group sprang into action, the Movimiento Revolucionario Tupac Amaru, or MRTA, which focused its attacks on the police and the armed forces. To quell the violence, the government sent in the military, a heavy-handed outfit that knew little about handling a guerrilla insurgency. There was torture and rape, plus disappearances and massacres, none of which did anything to put a stop to Sendero Luminoso or the MRTA. Caught in the middle were tens of thousands of poor campesinos who bore the brunt of the casualties. In the midst of this, Alan Garcia was elected to the presidency in 1985. Initially, his ascent generated a great deal of hope. He was young, he was a gifted public speaker, he was popular, and he was the first member of the storied APRA party to win a presidential election. But his economic program was catastrophic, and by the late 1980s, Peru faced a staggering inflation rate of 7,500%. Thousands of people were plunged into poverty. There were food shortages and riots. With the country in a state of chaos, the 1990 presidential elections took on more importance than ever. The contest was between famed novelist Mario Vargas Llosa and Alberto Fujimori, a little-known agronomist of Japanese descent. During the campaign, Vargas Llosa promoted an economic shock treatment program that many feared would send more Peruvians into poverty, while Fujimori positioned himself as an alternative to the status quo. Fujimori won handily. But as soon as he got into office, he implemented an even more austere economic plan, famously announced by his economic minister with the words, and may God help us. The plan, among other things, drove up the price of gasoline by 3,000%, collectively known as Fujishok. The measures ultimately succeeded in reducing inflation and stabilizing the economy, but not without costing the average Peruvian dearly. Fujimori followed this in April 1992 with a self-coup. He dissolved the legislature and generated an entirely new congress, one stocked with his allies. Peruvians, not unused to caudillos, tolerated the power grab, hoping that Fujimori might help stabilize the economic and political situation, which he did. The economy grew, and by the end of the year, leaders of both Sendero Luminoso and MRTA had been apprehended. The internal conflict, however, wasn't over. In December 1996, 14 members of MRTA stormed the Japanese ambassador's residence and hundreds of prominent people were taken hostage. The captors demanded that the government release imprisoned MRTA members, among other things. Most of the hostages were released early on, though 72 men were held until the following April, at which point Peruvian commandos stormed the embassy, killing every last captor and releasing the surviving hostages. By the end of his second term, Fujimori's administration was plagued by allegations of corruption. Having rigged the electoral machinery and procedures in his favor, the Peruvian president surprised no one by deciding to run for a third constitutionally dubious term in the 2000 elections. Despite having to deal with an unexpected runoff, he held on to win in the second round. 
Soon after, however, he was forced to flee the country after it was revealed that his security chief, Vladimiro Montesinos, had been embezzling government funds and bribing elected officials and the media. Many of these acts were caught on film, the Vladivideos, all 2,700 of them, riveted the nation when they first aired in 2001. Fujimori formally resigned the presidency from abroad, but the legislature rejected the gesture, voting him out of office and declaring him morally unfit to govern. Peru, however, hadn't heard the last of the former president. In 2005, he returned to South America, only to be arrested in Chile on long-standing charges of corruption, kidnapping, and human rights violations. He was extradited to Peru in 2007, and that same year was convicted of ordering an illegal search. Two years later, Fujimori was convicted of ordering extrajudicial killings, and three months after that, was convicted of channeling millions of dollars in state funds to Montesinos. In 2009, he also pleaded guilty to wiretapping and bribery and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. In the meantime, his daughter Keiko tried to keep the flame of Fujimorismo alive. She founded a new party called Fuerza Popular and even had some success coming very close to winning the presidency three times, but would ultimately be also arrested in 2018, accused of corruption. She was conditionally released in April 2020. But that was far into the future. Back in April 2001, there were new elections to find her father's successor. These were as free and fair as those of 2000 were tainted. The winner was Alejandro Toledo, the person that had come second against Fujimori and the first indigenous person to reach the presidency. Unfortunately, Toledo's time in office was a huge disappointment. Amid violence and property damage, promises were made and not kept, decisions reached and reversed, and new programs announced but not funded. Toledo's popularity declined to single digits for much of his five-year mandate. This occurred even in the context of renewed and sustained economic growth and a major decentralization initiative in 2003 and 2004 that created elected regional governments. However tainted Toledo's presidency though, there was never a sense that Peruvian democracy itself would collapse. The next election in 2006 brought the return of Alan Garcia. This version, however, turned out to be a completely reinvented one. Unlike in the 1980s, he became a big promoter of continued economic liberalization, including the ratification of free trade agreement with the United States in 2007. As a result, Peru's economy saw sustained growth. However, most of the highlands saw few benefits, and as Garcia's government provided inadequate attention to Peru's periphery, anger grew. For one, there was the issue of corruption. Garcia's entire cabinet was forced to resign in 2008 after widespread allegations of bribery. And in 2019, nearly eight years after the end of his presidency, Garcia opted to commit suicide when new investigations linked him to bribes over public works contracts. The 2011 elections then turned into a contest between Keiko, Alberto Fujimori's daughter, and Ollanta Humala, which the latter ultimately won. Barely. Humala was a retired member of the Peruvian military and pegged as a leftist radical. The day he won, the Peruvian stock exchange saw the largest drop ever. But once in office, he turned sharply to the right. Although the economy continued to grow, his popularity suffered dramatically, mostly because Peruvians really disliked his handling of social conflict in the country. Most notably, clashes between environmentalists and mining interests. He just seemed too aloof. The following election in 2016 was won by Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, or as the Peruvians know him, PPK. A trained economist, he was able to have the anti-Fujimorista vote coalesce around him, but he would face even more problems than his predecessors. Keiko's Fuerza Popular made his life miserable and would ultimately force him to resign accused of corruption. His erstwhile vice president, Martin Vizcarra, would face an almost identical fate two years later, although this time by official removal through impeachment. But by this point, many Peruvians were fed up with both the political instability and what they saw as an abuse of power from the congressional leaders. So when Manuel Merino, the president of Congress, and equivalent to the Speaker of the House in the U.S., succeeded Vizcarra in 2020, he faced massive street protests against his ascension to the presidency. At first, the government responded with force, but after the police killed two protesters, Marino's cabinet resigned. Protests became even larger, and Marino had no option but to resign as well. His presidency lasted five days. Yet another election in 2021 pitted the ever-present Keiko with Pedro Castillo, a union leader that was almost completely unknown up to that point, but who managed to win given Peruvian's distrust of Keiko and other mainstream candidates. Still, the new president had little support in Congress. Facing a recalcitrant legislature and inexperienced as he was, Castillo promptly experienced abysmal approval ratings. Then, on December 2022, he tried to gain the upper hand by closing down Congress and attempting a self-coup, just like Fujimori had done 30 years earlier. But the military failed to support him, and the legislature quickly removed him from office and put him in prison. This, in turn, put a new president in power, Dina Boluarte, 
and sparked even more massive protests than the ones in 2020, which the army promptly put down violently, leading to several massacres, including one in Ayacucho and Juliaca. Boluarte then called for new elections, which Congress finally agreed to and set for April of 2024. Thus, for now, calm has more or less returned to the country, but none of the underlying problems have been dealt with. The disarticulation in the last 30 years of all political parties has resulted in no one having a coherent ideology and having problems efficiently articulating the demands of the Peruvian citizenry. Likewise, each and every one of the living Peruvian presidents face formal criminal charges for corruption. In this way, Peruvians live in a country with political parties that do not represent their voters, where the entire political class is viewed with suspicion, and thus, Peru seems to be stuck in a permanent political crisis with no end in sight.